Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Thanks. Last week, Anth talked about how um, the original word for church was actually ecclesia. It was a different sort of thing. And I mean, you'll have to listen to the full story. But what qualified us to be part of it was being ordinary. But the outcome of it all can be very extraordinary. So I am believing tonight, absolutely, in what Dave said at the start, um, in a divine appointment for everybody, and also that we'll do some remembering, like um, Beth said. Now, um, Chris was due to speak tonight, and so she sent me her notes, and then I made some notes this morning, and I've kind of merged the two together, so I cannot take, um, not all these ideas, well, they're all mine now, but we've kind of done a lot of back and forth today. So in some senses, I'm doing um, my bit followed by an introduction to more thoughts that will come, that will be at least another part on what we're going to get to in the second half that we believe is going to really, really help you. Now, we talk all the time here about we have, how we have such good news. And I hope that you feel that the news is good and we are going to do our best to highlight what that good news is because you might be very aware of what some stuff isn't, but we want to make sure that you can articulate what it is exactly that we have come to and understood. Um, now, let me just ask you this one question, though. How can even bad news be good news? Okay, I'm just going to read you a few verses from um, Matthew 5. Okay, and we're just going to share some thoughts. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went upon a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All sounds very nice. All sounds very lovely, but you don't have to look far to think that some of those circumstances you find yourself in would not feel very blessed. They wouldn't. In reality, they would not feel ble very blessed. Now, how do we then start to see good news if what we're facing feels like bad news? Let me just go through them just briefly. Um, if we look at blessed are the poor in spirit, if you would just allow me to define poor in spirit as lack, that not enoughness we can feel in our lives. And the message puts it that you're blessed if you feel like you're at the end of your rope. Have you ever talked about how you're at the end of your tether? You're at the end of your rope. Um, and it's that last straw principle. If you put those pictures up for me, Robert, the ones with the camels, um, if you, you've heard the expression, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Oh, good, I'm glad you said that because it's not up there. Um, you've heard the expression, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Let me just read this to you and for the sake of the audio. There is always a final straw, but it's not any worse than the dozens of straws that came before it. They were the same. You just finally learnt the lesson that you are more than what you settled for. Very powerful, actually. So when we talk about the final straw, it's not that that giant straw is the one that's added last. It's actually more of the same, more of the same. But it gets to the point where you're just like, I am just done with this. Have we all been there at some point? Some of you may be there now. You really may be there tonight. Um, mourn. I mean, blessed are those who mourn. Some of you have lost people. Some of you have lost things. Some of you just feel a sense of loss tonight, perhaps. Blessed are the meek. I like this one. I looked at what it meant because I thought, right, 
Blessed are the meek. He's clearly, Jesus is clearly talking to people that might need to know that even the circumstance they're in, although it might feel bad, there was still good news for them. Now, when I looked up meek, it meant quiet, gentle. And then the next bit was easily imposed upon, submissive. And as I was thinking today, I thought, maybe you always feel like you're the one bending. You're the one accommodated. You're the one submitting. You're the one who has to always be the one that goes, okay, we'll do it your way. You're the one that feels like to get where things need to be, you're the one that has to just submit to and be trampled on in order to, for other people to be where they need to be. And hunger and thirst for righteousness. Perhaps you just can't put your finger on it. But if you think of just for tonight, the righteousness for the sake of keeping it simple, being that sense in which you believe you are as you ought to be, some of you just know there's something in you that just thinks, I just don't feel quite right. I just long to be comfortable in my own skin and how I ought to be. Blessed are the pure, in ha- uh, merciful, sorry is the next one, compassionate and kindly forbearance, con- kindly forbearance shown towards an offender. That's what merciful means, that you're going to be compassionate and kind towards someone that has offended you. When someone offends you, your first instinct isn't often to be compassionate and kind, is it? Let's face it. And perhaps you feel like you're the one that's always being having to be kind in the face of repeated offences. I don't know. Pure in heart. Now, we've learned about that before, and there was a word called sincere which is linked to the word sincere, and it was from um, an expression. In the ancient world, they used to make pots, and dishonest merchants would use wax to cover the cracks in their pottery in order to be able to sell it at a higher price, but it actually wasn't what they were claiming it to be because it had been filled in with wax. Um, Now, you might feel that you have an integrity about you that is not recognized along side others who seem to do a better job of covering their cracks and selling their own virtues. That's perhaps some of you tonight. People who deal in, forgive me, but BS, but seem to prosper. Some of you will get that. And peacemakers. Now, you only need to be a peacemaker if things aren't peaceful. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to make peace, would you? Because it would be there. And perhaps um, some of you feel like you're always the one trying to keep the peace. You're always the one. Links to that earlier one, doesn't it, really? Um, And then when we get to blessed are you if you're persecuted, reviled, spoken against. Well, they speak for themselves, aren't they? But apparently when that happens, we're blessed. That's our first reaction, isn't it? I hate you, but it's okay, I'm blessed. But these are all very human things we have to go through. So how is this good news when it actually seems like some negatives? Because actually this stuff sounds really hard because in life it can be really hard, let's face it. Now, we invite you to celebrate good news with us every week. We really do. And some of you are in a place in life where you are celebrating because you are in a brilliant, happy place. And we hope that you'll keep being in that brilliant, happy place because you help make the sound of celebration. But for some of you, you find it hard to celebrate because what's that football song? You only sing when... You only sing when you're winning. Sometimes it's hard to sing when you don't feel like you're winning. And so what can we... What can we do to get us all to a point of celebration tonight? Now, I understood again today that when Jesus spoke in parables, he talked about the kingdom of heaven is like. And every time you try and come up with an image to think, describe what it's like, you have to just pick an analogy that isn't perfect, but it gives a glimpse of it. Because how could you put all this into words? And I wanted to show you something that um, someone reminded me of. Um, it's one of those things you'll have seen before. But it... it kind of gave me a the kingdom of heaven is like moment when we were talking about it. So Robert, would you mind putting up those two? They're two images, but they're side by side. (laughs) I wish I was a magician. I wish I could do magic. Does anyone know how to do magic? I wish I could. Right. Okay. Right. Ignore the bit on the right for now. What do you see on the left? What do you see on the right? <laughs> okay. What most right studies have shown that when people are shown the thing on the right, um, nearly everybody responds that what they see is a black dot. Nearly everybody. That's what the study has shown. Um, because when participants are asked what do you see, they say I see a black dot. Now listen to this. Okay. Notice that the dot takes up less than 1% of 
it might not be proportionate because I made it today. Like, it takes up less than 1% of the entire page. What is left is a whole lot of white space. Apply this same principle to life. During any given day, there are black dots that occur. These dots come in many forms. A mistake you made at work, a conversation with a friend that disturbed you, an item of news on the radio, or any other potential distraction. Unfortunately, black dots are coated with Velcro. They seem to stick to you. I found that interesting because we were talking, if you heard on the other Wednesday night, we were talking about how negatives stick like Velcro and positives like Teflon recently. They occupy your thoughts and dampen your emotions. They're usually charged with something that triggers you, and because of that, they grow in size and take up a lot of space. You forget all about the white space around the dot. The white space, by the way, represents reality. For every black dot or similar distraction, there are many more events going on in your life that are positive. Unfortunately, when your focus goes to the black dot, the white space is forgotten. You become consumed by your less thans. You dive into it again and again, examining, examining it from all sides. And as you do so, it grows and grows, as in on the left. This, by the way, is a recipe for undermining yourself. And what they go on to say is that the message is, balance the dot with the white space. Choose to be conscious and aware of what is playing in the background, which I think links to your video clip there. Now, Jesus was talking about a revolutionary way of life because what he was saying to his listeners is that, yes, this is the stuff that you are facing. This is your black dot. But there is a bigger picture far beyond what feels like the dominant landscape of your life, far beyond yet occurring within the day-to-day -day circumstances of what we experience. He was talking about an overarching story that there is more, does more, dominates more, and that the overarching story is very, very good. Now, the plot does thicken in life, doesn't it? And, and this is what it made me think today. In a good story, the plot thickens. You talk about the plot thickens. There are twists, there are turns, there are tensions, there are different chapters that you find yourself in. But overall, it is a good story, and all of your stuff is included in that story. Um, do you know, I was thinking, uh, I, I wrote it down as I was stood down there, there is so much more to my story than me. There's so much more to my story than me. If I make the whole of my story my black dots, and that's all there is, what about all the other stuff around my story? Not just the God stuff that I believe is invested in my life and part of my life, but your stuff. I wouldn't be here without you people. I wouldn't have come to this point in my story without you because there's more to our story. Now, there's an idiom that's called the devil is in the details. Who's heard that expression? The devil's in the detail. And it actually means that mistakes are usually made in the small details of a project. So it's usually, it's cautionary to pay attention to the details to avoid failure. But it made me think today about the devil's in the detail. I almost took it literally, really. Because, you know, we come to beliefs about all sorts of details in life that then straightjacket us into certain paths. We decide this is this, that is that, that is the other, and that, that's the story. And, and nearly always we get to these beliefs through the details, through the black dots, through the things that just finish us off, through the conversations and the looks and all the, the details, and we forget the whole story. Now, Let's just go on for a minute and consider what happens later on in Matthew 5. Jesus talks about loving our enemies in great detail. And this is another aspect of the way of life available to ordinary people who want to do and be extraordinary in every way. Now, we focus on our own black dots sometimes, but we also focus on other people's, let's call them black, black marks. I was reminded of that expression this week. You know, we talk about people have a black mark against them. And some of you, I know for certain, have, you've almost got black marks against yourself. When you think about yourself, you've got big black marks against what you're not and what you haven't done. And then you've also, if we're not careful, got black marks against other people. Things that have happened that have somehow been like, well, that's, that's just a big X in the box. Now, we focus on our own and others' black marks, 
And, and I do say our own, because if we're talking about enemy love, we can be our own enemy. So if we're called to love our enemies, what if you're your own enemy? What if you're your own enemy? That's the person you've got to be called to love. Now, the black mark is a long-lasting negative impact of a mistake. It's when something happens that you now think is going to have a long-lasting impact on your life. And that mistake can absolutely dominate the landscape and become the whole story. Now, I don't want to get into what we believe about the devil here, because that's a whole other scenario. But let's just talk about the fact that we've understood that part of the nature of it means adversary. Contrary, opposing, opposite. So the details of what we see and experience directly will often give way to attitudes that set a course in our relationship and cause them to break down. So what can happen is that all of a sudden we're faced with something that just seems contrary or opposite or opposing and all of that rises within us, causes us to start getting into those black marks and all of a sudden you have things breaking down. No longer are there white spaces that make up for shortcomings. There's just that splodge of hurt and fear and a list of all those things that we heard about at the beginning that really just becomes, well, all I see is that black mark. Never mind all the white space. Never mind all that has gone before. This moment here is the only thing that I can see, and that is now the story. Um, one of the things that happens when we get consumed with, with that black dot is we get into um, retaliation. Now, it sounds like aggressive word, and we wouldn't say, oh, well, we're just going to retaliate because it sounds so negative. But the truth is, that is what's going on because we feel like a wrong has been done that we have to now right the wrong, and we get into trying to even things up. Now, Matthew 5 talks about turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, and enemy love. It basically talks about the fact that as part of what we're called to in this way of life, we have to forgo some of our rights and actually kill our enemies with love. Now, this is what it says. That's a read. It's the bit, verse 38, Robert. This is just the go the second mile bit, and this is a bit of a precursor to what Chris will do in more detail when she has a voice, I'm sure. <laughs> you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak too. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what, re what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, there is so much to unpick there, so much. So just allow me to start this story and just trust that we're going to fill in some of the gaps and break it down and really help get to some great revelation about it. But Jesus wants us to ask the question, if someone does something evil to me, how may I respond with only good in return? Now, if you don't have a revelation of the white space, of the overarching story of humanity, you are not going to be able to do that because it's an extraordinary thing that you're being asked to do that has to be within the context of a much bigger story. Now, in Jesus' day, a slap to one's face was considered such a gross insult by the Jews and was among one of the most demeaning acts you could inflict on another person. To be fair, I think it would still be pretty bad now. 
Do not think if someone came and slapped you on the face. Slapping someone on the cheek was a sign of contempt and a terrible insult. Receiving the back of the hand meant that you were scorned as inconsequential. It just meant you were a nothing. How many times in life have you found yourself in a situation where how you've been treated has just made you feel like an absolute nothing? And yet what Jesus is calling us to and saying is the way of life is to say, do you know what? That's going to be something in your life that is a moment, but there's still a bigger story. That is challenging, isn't it? Um, now, how do we respond when someone makes us feel like nothing? And this is not about being passive or weak, because it actually may be necessary to take action, but what sort of action is the point? One that is seeking to promote the white spaces as the whole story, or one that says, you must pay because the black mark that this has created must be addressed or I'm out. There's a big difference. One is going to work through, the other is going to demand justice. Tiger Woods won the Masters tournament. He's a golfer. And Fuzzy, I mean, what, what a wonderful name. There's someone called Fuzzy. Mind you, he's called Tiger. My cat's called Tiger. Tiger Woods won the Masters tournament. Fuzzy Zola responded with mean, racist remarks. Remarks he intended to be funny, but were only mean-spirited. Fuzzy received a great deal of well-deserved criticism for his comments, but this is what Tiger Woods' response was. We all make mistakes. It's time to move on. It's amazing, isn't it? Tiger could have returned the insult, the media would have loved it, but he refused to retaliate. Instead, he said, let's move on. Is this your attitude when you are on the receiving end of something? Can you say, we all make mistakes, but it's time to move on? Please don't, please don't hear what I'm not saying, that some things don't have to be addressed. That's not what I'm saying. Hear my spirit. Can we see it as part of an overarching story, or is it a deal breaker? Jesus did not give tit for tat. He was not in the business of getting even. Now, the other thing you might be concerned about in these things is what about, what about how it looks to other people, what about my, my reputation? Are we willing to leave retaliation in God's hands? Jesus often confronted those around him, but he was not vindictive. He did not threaten his accusers with harm. He addressed it, he dealt with it, but it was from a good spirit. Now, there's lots more that we want to bring about this and talk about this because it's, it's huge and highly significant. But let me just leave you with this. Um, let me just leave you with this sense of a story. From, it was a movie on the life of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi studied Christianity in England but never became a Christian because he claimed Christianity didn't seem to work for Christians. There's a thought. Although he wasn't impressed by the Christians he met, he was very impressed with Jesus, especially his teaching on the Sermon of the Mount, which was the bit I read to you at the start. Gandhi tried to incorporate Jesus' wisdom into his own life. At one point in the movie, civil war breaks out between Pakistan and India. The war stems from divisions between the Muslims of Pakistan and the Hindus of India. Gandhi lies on a cot after weeks of fasting in protest to this war. A distraught Hindu man approaches him. His only son, still a little boy, has been shot and killed in the conflict. His heart is full of sadness, bitterness, and revenge. Gandhi can barely speak, but tells the man how to heal his own heart. Find a little Muslim boy whose father has been killed. Take that boy as your son and raise him as a Muslim. The distraught man walks away completely confused and disappointed. Apparently, he thought the weeks of fasting had weakened Gandhi's ability to reason. It made no sense to him whatsoever. Um, that's a love without limits, isn't it? Because that's opposite to what you would expect to be asked to do. Very, very, very challenging. Now, our perception of mistakes in ourselves and others, in my view, must never outweigh the white spaces. It must never outweigh the white spaces. The blessing, favor, forgiveness, grace, love on our lives, whatever happens in the detail, cannot come close to all of the white space that we have bought into because there is that never-ending story towards us. Now, the devil is in the detail. I discovered today has, uh, was originally called um, God is in the detail. Nobody knows when it changed. 
but it used to be God is in the detail, then all of a sudden it became the devil's in the detail. But originally, the, the expression was God is in the detail. And I want to encourage you tonight to pay attention to the detail in your life in order to see truth in all things. That if all things are working for our good, do we actually believe that? Or is that something we just give lip service to? Is that something that we can believe? That whatever's going on there is an overarching, never-ending story that has more investing in us than is being taken from us. Can we believe that? Can we believe that? And the overarching story is of restoration, wholeness, and resurrection. That is the overarching story. Can we believe that that's what will win and that the rest is detail, the rest is the black dot, but the overarching story is restoration, wholeness, resurrection. And can we believe? Can we believe in that? Now, I'm just going to finish with one thought, that one of the things I've worked out today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I looked at what that meant in different versions. And you do look at what these things in different versions, and you do pick your favorite. <laughs> you can always go and look at the others. But the one that stood out to me when I looked up blessed are the pure in heart, it said free from every admixture, like AD mixture, free from every admixture of what is false, sincere, genuine. And what came to me is that that admixture is the action of mixing or, the, or the, the fact of being mixed. And let me tell you what I believe it means for us in the light of what we've been learning here. That if we mix faith and works in our approach to ourselves and people, we're going to really struggle to see God, to see the overarching story. We don't we can't say, well, God loves, forgives, accepts you because it's a gift and you're intrinsically valuable and loved. But by the way, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, it's all over. That can't be the mix. It can't be you've got it by faith, but you've got to keep it by works. It can't work like that. And that, for me, is the white space, that the overarching story is that what we're here is that what we're trying to be and are, I've lost my place, I was doing really well. I've got to right before the end before I've lost some space. That's quite good for me. The overarching story for me of who we are is that we are people that genuinely are going to accept people on the basis of God's investment in them. Not on their behavior, not on whether they've got things right or wrong, not on a measure of how many black marks have you got against you versus how many ticks of things we're happy with. That is not how you are going to be measured in this building, in this place, by us leading and trying to take us in a great direction, by Anthony Chris with the ultimate oversight. I can tell you I have seen firsthand I actually think this is really important, but I just need to be able to speak. <laughs> You're right, Diamond. I promise you this is not planned because it's not in my notes, I promise you. What I sometimes wish is that we could be more, um, sometimes I wish we could be more open. And the balance you have to get as leaders, and you will know this from your work environments and everything else, is that to have integrity, you have to keep, keep confidential people's stuff. But in not being able to share people's stuff, you then can't always tell the whole story. And I am in a lot of conversations um, with Anth, with Chris, 
with the directors, with the leaders, and I have to tell you, and you need to trust me, they act with absolute integrity in the overarching story of what The Rock is. And that is that you will not be treated as your sins may deserve, and neither will we. This will be our overarching story. And that is how things are dealt with. And you need to know that we have that integrity, and you need to know that there will, we will not be dealing in black marks, in behaviours, in mistakes, in lifestyle choices. We will not be dealing with any of this stuff. We will be judging and measuring people on the investment of God in them. That is how people are dealt with. That is how things are measured. And a lot of that goes on that may be unseen to you, because if we were to tell you what the choices were, we wouldn't then be dealing with people with integrity that their choices aren't going to count against them. Do you hear my heart on that? So I don't know why I'm having a moment. It might be that I was supposed to have a moment and share that with you, but I have even recently, I have been in dealing with some stuff with Anse and Graham and um, in lots of conversation with Chris with some stuff. And I am in awe and inspired by their integrity to this message that I wish I could tell you the stuff that I can't tell you because it wouldn't be right. But I need you to trust us. I need you to trust the team. And I need you to commit as well that we will be part of wholeness, restoration, resurrection, that... That's the story of this house. That is who we are, and I am incredibly proud of it. I am trusting exactly where we're going. We're inspired, we're hearing God, and I just want you to believe in the overarching story of who we are. And I want to say, for goodness sake, but that might sound aggressive, but Connie would tell me to go for it. But for goodness sake, don't get lost in details. That is not the story story. The stuff isn't the story. Behaviors aren't the story. Moments of history aren't the story. The story is the story, and the story is wholeness, resurrection, liberation. There you go, she's just talked. Um, that's the story, and um, please will you... Um, talk to us. We all go through things in life where we just think, I'm just not sure what's going on. And we were in a conversation this week and someone was expressing that they weren't sure about something and they hadn't been sure about something for months. And actually when they talked about it, we were in the same place. So some of the stuff, just talk to us. Just talk. Because it really is okay and we really are all okay. Right. I think I should stop. But that's all right. That's all right. Let's, should we... Will you stand with me if you can stand and believe that you can be part of a story in this place that is about wholeness, resurrection, and liberation? Who, want, who believes in that story? Because I do. And I almost want us to, I almost want us to shout. <laughs> almost want, you can't shout. Or maybe you can. Liberation. Um, if we believe that it's wholeness, what did I say? What were my things I said? Wholeness, resurrection. Wholeness, resurrection. Oh, there's too many now. Wholeness, restoration, resurrection, liberation. Can we, can we remember all them? Right. Um, just pick one. <laughs> right. Let's just say that we believe. Right, okay. We're going to say this. We believe in wholeness, resurrection, liberation, and we're committed to it. Whoa, feel like we're in, whoa. Okay, three, two, one. We believe in, oh, come on, that's a bit. <laughs> we're what? We're, okay, right, we're changing it. We're committed to wholeness, resurrection, liberation. Right, I want you to proper shout it. Three, two, one. We're committed. Right, let that be the story. Let that be the story for us all. I'm done. Right. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.